Lord, thank you for these words this morning that have directed our eyes backwards towards the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where our sins were paid for in full, where we were brought in victory to you. And thank you for lifting our gaze to a day yet to come when we will be with you, when we will sin no more, when you will be vindicated, when we will love you perfectly. Lord Jesus, come quickly. And we pray this morning that your word would have its effect on our hearts that you intend, that your spirit would prepare the way for us to yield to your ways, your directives, uh, to be moved by the cross and to be moved by eternal realities. God, I thank you for this body of believers, these members of one another. We will rejoice with one another forever and ever and ever in your presence. And we pray that until you take us home, we might be faithful to live as a body joined together in interdependent love for you, love for one another. And we pray that this might be a vehicle by which your gospel goes to the city and to the ends of the earth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We will finish this morning life in the body of Christ. What does it mean to live out the Christian life under the reign of grace in the local church? We've been looking at 13 directives that the Apostle Paul gives to us here in Romans 12. Directives for how to conduct ourselves in the church. How do we live with one another? And this morning, by way of introduction, I want to take us back to the 1500s, to France. I want to contemplate for a few moments French Huguenot history. Huguenot was the term given in possibly a derogatory manner to those who were French Protestants, those who had uh, engaged with the gospel of Jesus Christ as part of the Reformation that was sweeping through Europe. It was October 31st, 1517 that Martin Luther penned his 95 theses and nailed them to the door of the castle church at Wittenberg. Luther perhaps was not even a believer at that time, but launched what has come to be known as the Protestant Reformation. The Bible was rediscovered, the truths of the gospel were rediscovered, and these truths spread throughout Europe. The gospel was spreading in France in the early part of the 1500s and came up against severe Roman Catholic opposition. Pastors were killed, men were burned at the stake, women and children were drowned in the rivers. In 1533, John Calvin, who was a pastor in Paris, fled to Geneva. And in 1541, John Calvin published his Institutes of the Christian Religion. You may be familiar with the giant theology textbook. Uh, it was published in French in 1541. And in its first iteration, it was not designed primarily to be a theology textbook, but was a warm-hearted, passionate appeal to the king of France, King Francis I. And it laid out for King Francis I biblical New Testament Christian doctrine. And it appealed to him on the basis of the New Testament, please stop persecuting Christians in your nation. You claim to be a Christian king. You say you love the Bible. Let me just lay out for you what the Bible says so that you'll stop drowning women and children and burning pastors. That was the point of the Institutes in the first French edition in 1541. 88 pastors were smuggled into France in the 1550s. These were pastors trained in Geneva under Calvin and sent back into their homeland. 88 pastors were trained in the 1550s. 88 pastors were martyred in the 1550s. In the 1560s, Huguenots escaped. They began fleeing France, and they went all over the world. Uh, in the 1560s, French Huguenots came to Florida and South Carolina. There is a French Huguenot society headquartered in South Carolina to this day. On August 24th, 1572, St. Barth Bartholomew's Day. The King of France, at that time King Charles, under the direction of his mother, the Queen Mother of France, who was Catherine of Medici, whose great-great-uncle 
was Niccolo Machiavelli. You may be familiar with Machiavellian machinations. Machiavelli was an Italian philosopher who was a realist in political theory, and he decided that it was time for kings and rulers to dispense with any facade of Christian morality. That just gets in the way of getting done what needs to be done as a ruler. So we all know that we're all Christians, all of us kings and queens, and, and we all know that we kill people and we dispense with our enemies and we do whatever we want to get the job done. We, let's just admit that up front and say it's okay. <laughs> that, that politics and rulership and morality really have nothing to do with one another. And Catherine Medici was a fantastic disciple of her great, great uncle. And as the queen mother of France set out in earnest to dispense with what she called the heretics, the Huguenots, the French Protestants, the Grace Bible churches of France. And so on St. Bartholomew's Day, the king, under the direction of his mother, set out to exterminate every Huguenot in Paris. And it wasn't enough for them to say, hey, no Huguenots allowed, we'll give you a month, get your stuff and get out of here. No, they closed the gates of the city and kept them in and sent out bands of armed soldiers to assassinate them one by one, beginning with the nobles, beginning and then following with the merchants and those who had money down to the common people. And in the morning, Sunday morning of St. Bartholomew's Day, after all of the nobles were killed, the king unleashed the Parisian mob and said, look, you can have anything you want from anybody you want to call a Huguenot. Take his stuff, take his titles and lands. All you have to do is kill him. And they threw babies out of third-story windows. Uh, they drowned men and women in the rivers. They piled up corpses all over the city. Really a tragic scene in French history that has had repercussions throughout European history down to this very day. In April 13th, 1598, 26 years later, a new king, a Protestant king, issued the Edict of Nantes, which was a cessation of hostilities against the French Protestants. That edict of uh, peace towards the Protestants was revoked in 1685, almost 100 years later, by King Louis XIV, who reinstated the kinds of massacres that took place in St. Bartholomew's Day. It wasn't until 1787, another 100 years later, that the Edict of Toleration and the free exercise of free conscience in religion was issued. You had really a period of 200 years, the 16th and 17th centuries, where to believe the Bible was punishable by death. And not a death following a fair trial, but mob rule, torture, execution, burnings, assassinations. And so Christians in France during this time faced significant dilemma. <laughs> Do we stay? Do we fight? Do we run away? Can we run away? And you had floods of French Huguenots leaving France. By the way, today, France is less than 3% Protestant and far less than that in terms of evangelical Protestant. More than 50% Catholic and nearly 40% atheistic. France had a remarkable opportunity of the gospel sweeping through the nation in every city represented by faithful Bible teaching and the gospel proclaimed and then almost entirely eradicated by persecution. As the French Protestants left France in various waves of persecution, they went to the, they went to the uh, continent of Africa. They went all the way to South Africa. They came to the New World here and established colonies and places to live. They were received in Holland. They were received in Germany. They went to Switzerland. They went to England. And everywhere the Huguenots went, they were in need because they left with nothing, <laughs> traipsing through the forests of Europe with no, no clothes, no belongings, all of their things stripped away. And they were completely and totally dependent on the kindness and the hospitality of other Christians wherever they went. And remarkable things happened throughout Europe and in the New World and on other continents Christians 
opened their doors, opened their homes, opened their checkbooks to total strangers and helped them to establish new life in new places in the midst of tragedy. The directives we look at this morning in Romans 12, 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality, are two commands that were absolutely needed in those centuries in France. Two commands that are hard for us to grasp in the depth in which Paul intended them in the first century. Although Christians, even today in our world, throughout the world, in various places, are in need of these very things. Brothers and sisters in Hong Kong, brothers and sisters in China, brothers and sisters in North Africa, uh, all over the world, Christians are in need in a dire way for other Christians to be ready to meet physical needs and to practice hospitality. Let's look together at these two commands in verse 13, and we'll back up to verse 9 and read our text again and be familiar again with these 13 directives for life in the church. Paul writes, let love be without hypocrisy, verse 9. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. And then verse 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. The first one I've labeled, own the needs of believers. Believers have needs, Christian, own them, make them your own. The New American Standard translates the text this way, contributing to the needs of the saints. It is quite literally a sharing in the needs of the saints. And let's make sure we understand the word saint as we begin. In medieval theology, a saint was a spiritual superhero who did miracles and gets voted in as a saint by ecclesiastical uppity-ups after he's dead. Kind of a posthumous hall of fame. But biblically, a saint is just a Christian. Any Christian. Every Christian is a saint. It just means one who is set apart unto God by God's grace. And remember how this letter to the Romans began. Romans 1.7 to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is not writing to dead spiritual superheroes, but to normal everyday Christians. And when he says contribute to the needs of the saints, we need to understand that he's talking about needs here. Contributing to the needs of Christians is not the same thing as enabling the indolence of Christians. You remember what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, when we were among you, we used to give you this order, if anyone is not willing to work, he is not to eat. So contributing to the needs is not the same thing as an enabling of laziness amongst Christians. That laziness is to be rebuked. But Christians are commanded here to meet the needs of saints. And this word for contributing is a remarkable word. It's the word koinonia. It is the word commonly used for fellowship. It means to become a partaker with or to have participation together or a sharing in something. And Paul is not saying here, share your stuff with those who have needs. He is saying, share in the needs of others. Become a partaker in those needs. You see, the contributing to the needs doesn't quite catch the intimacy or the attachment that Paul has in mind here. This word is used for a closeness of fellowship and attachment throughout the New Testament. In Acts 2.42, the early followers of Jesus were said to devote themselves to fellowship. Same word. A Jew and Gentile had fellowship in spiritual things, Romans 15.27. By the way, the idea that Jew and Gentile were now fellows, that they enjoyed fellowship and intimate connection in spiritual realities was a bit of a shock in the first century. It went across the Jew-Gentile divide. In fact, nearly every chapter of the New Testament is fraught with the racial tension that came with Gentiles having free access and equal footing with Jews in the local church. 
and they are said to have fellowship together. The Christians have been called into fellowship with Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. You were called into fellowship with God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians also have a share or a fellowship, same word, in the sufferings of Christ. 1 Peter 4, 13, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. And Philippians 3.10, Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. To be a Christian is to be a partaker in, a sharing in, a fellowship in, a life of suffering even as our Savior. In 2 John 11, Christians are particularly commanded not to have a share or a fellowship with false teachers. To have a partnership or a fellowship with false teachers is to participate in his evil deeds, John says in 2 John 11. And in Macedonia, Christians, out of their own poverty, begged Paul to be able to participate in the financial support of other Christians. 2 Corinthians 8, 4 says, they begged us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. Same word, fellowship, a sharing in. This fellowship or participation or sharing in the needs of the saints reflects the very nature of what the church is supposed to be. And we read it earlier in Romans 12, 5, we are members of one another. Like a physical body, we are connected and dependent upon each other. We are to be partakers of others and their gifts, Romans 12, 5. And here in Romans 12, 13, we are partakers of their needs. We are to be sharers in their needs. John Murray has said, we are to identify ourselves with the needs of the saints and to make those needs our very own. Charles Hodge says, the joy or sorrow of one member is the joy or sorrow of all the others. The necessities of one are or should be a common burden. You and I as Christians are to relieve the needs of our brothers and sisters as though we were relieving our own needs. This word for fellowship is often used in the New Testament for this very kind of practical assistance. Romans 15, 26, Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Same word for fellowship and participation. Hebrews 13, 16, the author writes, do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So often in the New Testament, this refers to financial needs. But not always, and we should not limit our concern to merely finances. A heart of selfless love expressed in generosity to meet needs of believers expresses itself in other areas, care, time, service, prayer. The joys of my brothers and sisters in Christ are to become my own joys. The sorrows of my brothers and sisters in Christ become my own sorrows. Their concerns are your concerns. Their burdens are your burdens. Their need of prayer becomes our need of prayer. And the bottom line is this. The needs of others in the church become my needs. To contribute to the needs of the saints, or better, to become a partaker in their needs, a sharer in their needs, is to make their needs my own. To own them. To supply the wants of our brothers with as much care as if we were supplying our own. By the way, what do we truly own? What do we own? Whose resources have been placed at our disposal? Belongings, money, time, abilities, talents. We are stewards of these resources. They are all on loan to us from God. And we are to see them as a reservoir for meeting the needs of others in the body of Christ. And the priority for this meeting of needs is the church. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 6.10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So Paul says, Christians, be good to everybody. And then he says, especially And sometimes in English, especially means something like a subset. I really like ice cream. I especially like Bluebell. 
or I really like bluebell ice cream, I especially like peppermint that only comes out at Christmas time, right? And, and by that, I typically mean I like all kinds of ice cream, but my favorite of the favorites is this. But especially, originally in English, just meant specifically or particularly. And in the Greek New Testament, it has that same meaning. It's not so much, I love all these things and I really want to talk about my favorite. But it means something more like, I'm mentioning this category and now I'm going to zero in on what I'm really talking about. It is the word for a narrowing focus. And here Paul says, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. And now let me zero in on what I'm talking about specifically, especially to those who are of the household of faith. You see, Paul is not enjoining us here to meet every need that exists, but very specifically to meet needs in the body of Christ. What should the world see in us? What should the world see in the church? Particularly a care for each other. The world shouldn't look in on the church and see a group of people that get together around a set of ideas, but needs go unmet. People are not cared for. Now, the world should see selfless love expressed in a participation, a fellowship in each other's needs. It is not the mission of the church to solve the inequalities of the world. Christians love. Christians love their neighbor. Christians love unbelieving neighbors. Christians are to be kind. Christians are to be generous and selfless. Christian. You ought to be kind and meet needs where you find them. But the command here for body life in the church is very particularly, meet the needs of the brethren. Meet the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And Christians are especially to be known for their real love for one another. Selfless, sacrificial love. The kind of love that says, my stuff is not my own and I am eager to give and give and give as a reflection of my Savior for those whom he loves. And even within the church, there is a certain priority of this kind of care. In 1 Timothy 5, uh, Paul gives direction that the believer's family is to be cared for particularly. 1 Timothy 5, 4, if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. And down in 1 Timothy 5, 8, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So Christian, you need to take care of your family and meet pressing needs there. And Christian, we need to meet one another's needs. This is under the banner of selfless love and what it means to be a body of Christ together. We meet needs. Grace Bible Church has a benevolence ministry, a budget for benevolence, and a, a place you can give specifically to meet pressing benevolence needs. You can give to that fund and specify that you'd like to give to that fund. Uh, if you want to give that way, those funds are dispensed uh, by direction from the elders. So there is some investigation of the need and care given to how those funds are dispensed. But many of you give to meet needs in the body of Christ totally unbeknownst to anybody else. And that is a reflection of your kindness and love that the grace of God produces in a life and in a heart. And many of you in this room have benefited from others just anonymously, not knowing what their left hand and their right hand are doing, giving to meet needs. And many of you have done the same thing and met other people's needs in a time of need. It's so commendable and it marks a love that God produces and a mentality towards each other that we truly participate in each other's needs in each other's lives. There is a danger in a command like this that someone whose heart is full of envy at what someone else might have gets a hold of this verse and says, see, you need to share with me. I don't have all the things that you have. Inequality is sinful. Have you heard these arguments? Uh, if, if your heart, if you're listening right now and your heart is not thinking first, 
I am one of the wealthiest people who has ever walked the face of the earth. And I must seek needs to meet, and I must give and give and give. If that's not your heartbeat, you're missing the point of this passage. If your application of this passage is, hey, there's people in this church that have more than me, I want some of that. (laughs) You are not operating under the banner of love. And a little perspective is helpful. The, The poorest of the poor in 21st century America live with more conveniences and more ease than just about anybody else in human history and more than most of the people in the world today. We ought not think of uh, needs in terms of relationships to others and possessions. We ought rather to have a Christ-like eagerness to empty self and give and give and give. And listen, if you are in a time of financial need, we want to know about that. The elders want to care and reach out and meet needs. So just as a practical application of this verse, all of us ready to give, all of us ready to meet needs, all of us ready to have an open hand with the resources God has made us stewards of. And sometimes it requires a significant humility to say, I have a need. However you got there, I have a need. And believers love to care for each other. This certainly was a need in the 15th and 16th centuries in France and all over Europe where French Huguenots fled, where Christians opened up their homes to other Christians, Christians who had planted in another area made the doors wide open for many more to come. And in each of the cities where Huguenots fled, the roles of those cities, of people entering those cities, show how many came through the gates and really overwhelmed the resources. And Christians gave and gave and gave. Really remarkable period of church history. Our last directive, number 13, in the second half of Romans 12, 13, is pursue hospitality. Pursue hospitality. The New American Standard just says practicing hospitality. And the word practice here is a word meaning to chase after, to pursue. Most often in the New Testament, it's actually the word translated to persecute, to chase after somebody to harm them. It is the word used of the enemies of Christ chasing down Christians. Jesus predicted in Matthew 10, 23, whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. In Philippians 3, 6, Paul says, I persecuted the church. Same word. But in the same chapter, Paul goes on to say, I press on toward the goal. So Paul chased down the church to harm the church, and then he chases the goal of godliness and the upward call of Christ. And what we have here in Romans 12 is not the negative connotation of chasing someone down to harm them, but really rather just the opposite. It still carries the idea of pursuit. And in Romans 12, 13, the word is used to describe how Christians ought to feel about hospitality. We are to pursue opportunities to be hospitable. Now, what is hospitality? You may think of entertaining guests, nice table settings at dinner parties. Maybe you think of warm chocolate chip cookies in a hotel lobby or the napkin origami at a fancy restaurant. You know, when they take your table setting and the napkin and they, somebody folds it into a swan or something. Maybe the friendly orange and purple clad info people at Sky Harbor Airport with the great big signs that say, ask me. Have you seen them? Anybody asked them a question? I wanna go up and ask, what's the capital of Connecticut? And just see what happens. We have in our nation today the hospitality industry, hotels, restaurants, tourism, uh, conference planners. We have hospitality suites, hospitality staff, hospitality marketing management. You can get a hospitality major in college. But what is hospitality biblically? Hospitality translates a compound word in the original, essentially love towards strangers. Love towards strangers. That is, it means to have a welcome hand, an open hand, and help 
towards people you've never met, and, and particularly here, Christians you've never met. And they become strangers no more. That is stranger love. That is hospitality. It is the process by means of which an outsider's status is changed from stranger to guest, says Colin Cruz. In the first century context, this was really important. For most of human history, travel has been difficult. I don't know if you know, but the Travelocity website is a rather new invention in the history of getting from one place to the other. Planning ahead and picking a place to stay and even seeing pictures and making a reservation. These are all new features. If you read about medieval European history, you discover that nobody ever really traveled more than about seven miles from his home in a lifetime because it was so difficult and so dangerous. The woodlands of Europe were dark and filled with beastly animals and robbers, and roads were hard to come by, and vehicles were slow. It cost a lot of money to go anywhere, and so people just didn't. And if you had to travel, if you were some sort of emissary or ambassador, you would take a small army with you just to protect you on the way really was difficult, and, and travel by sea was not safe either. In our day, we have the Motel 6. You know why it's called Motel 6? Because when it first came out, it cost $6 to stay the night, and Super 8 was an $8 a night motel. I know prices have gone up, but it's still remarkably convenient to go someplace that will leave the light on for you. You're just going to feel welcome when you show up and you can make plans and you can get in your car and pump gas and get from one point to the other and have a place to sleep. This is a remarkable modern luxury. Without that, Christian hospitality becomes absolutely critical. You see, the gospel was not designed to stay within a seven-mile radius of Jerusalem. Where was the gospel going to go? Jerusalem, Judea. Samaria, the Samaritans, ugh. and the uttermost parts of the earth. How is it going to get there? By people going, walking, sailing, riding a horse. Hard stuff, dangerous. Paul talks in 2 Corinthians 11 of being in danger constantly in his travels. It was just not a guarantee that you would show up where you intended to go. Travel was not safe. Christians were persecuted. There were few hotels, and there were even fewer safe ones. Hotels were establishments given to people who did not want to be known, who wanted to be away from where people knew them and wanted to do bad things. Hotels were not good places for Christians to go. Colin Cruz writes, strangers needed hospitality. For otherwise, they would be treated as non-human because they are potentially a threat to the community. Strangers had no standing in law or custom and therefore needed a patron in the community they were visiting. There was no universal brotherhood in the ancient Mediterranean world. And listen, I know there are pockets of the kind of distancing of strangers even in our world today. There are places you can go in America where you will be treated as an outsider and you will not be welcome. And, and in America's history, uh, that has been a significant problem for people of different ethnicities. Do you remember the Jim Crow laws? Do you remember the no Irish need apply? Now, throughout American history, strangers have been unwelcome in the neighborhoods. In Acts 18.2, we read of the edict of Claudius, the emperor of Rome who expelled all Jews from Rome. He believed that Jews were stirring up trouble and dissension in Rome, and he just wanted to be rid of them. He said, no Jews here, and expelled them all. Whether or not 100% of them got out of the city or not, we don't know. But this had a profound effect on Jewish presence in Rome, many of whom were now Christians. And after the recension of that edict... Jews were allowed back into their home city. 
But those Jews who had been banished from Rome often came back with nothing. And Paul here is writing a letter to the Romans, encouraging them to be hospitable, to be those who love strangers, who welcome strangers in as guests because those Christians coming back to Rome would be in need. The churches at Rome, Jew and Gentile alike, needed to be ready to receive these stragglers. While American church life does not often present the kind of opportunities that Paul was speaking into in this letter, a heart of hospitality and a readiness for hospitality must be the practice and the pursuit of every Christian. There will probably be a day when Christians move to town and are in need of logistical help, finding an apartment, finding a house, unloading their belongings, finding a job, finding a car. And I know our Facebook page, GBC Friends, has been a remarkable resource for people expressing those kinds of needs and those needs being met. Some of you have even served officially on committees in churches, the move-in committee, getting people together to help people unload when they move into town. And of course, there will be times when missionaries come through town and need a place to stay. And they need not just a light on and a hot meal, but they need encouragement, spiritual feeding, prayer, a place to just come and let their hair down and let their kids run around and break stuff and eat stuff. Missionaries need that. Third John 5 to 8 describes that very kind of thing. Beloved, says the Apostle John, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, especially when they are strangers. They have testified to your love before the church, and you will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. By sharing your things, your time, your home, you are participating in the advance of the gospel when missionaries come through town. There may come a day when persecuted Christians need refuge. There may come a day when Christians coming through have no possessions, no resources, no means to pay you, They will simply be in need, exiled, traveling, dependent. It was ubiquitous. It was everywhere in the first century church. It has been true in various places at various times throughout church history. It may be true here one day. This command for hospitality is a requirement for spiritual leadership is listed in the qualifications for elders, for pastors, in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1. And it is also a directive for all Christians to follow. And to pursue hospitality, to chase after it, is to take initiative. To practice true hospitality is to do so without regret. To do so not begrudgingly, not to grumble about it, not to tell other people what a burden these people were, (laughs) but to do so with joy. 1 Peter 4, 9 says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. A heart of hospitality is fundamentally a radical commitment to others. It is getting outside of yourself and thinking about others' needs. What does it mean for us on a Sunday morning to be hospitable as a church? It means to make strangers feel at home to open hearts and hands and make them feel welcome, make people who are here for the first time no longer feel like strangers. Do you remember the first time you came to Grace Bible Church? Did you know anybody? Did did you look up the church on the internet? Did you see a sign and walk in? Maybe you had a couple of friends. Do you remember what you felt, what you thought? Can you go back there? And then turn the tables and look around you on a Sunday morning. And open your heart, open your time, open your conversations to people you haven't met yet. They are strangers so far, but we pray that they will not be strangers long. Do 
Kenny Williams has told me about his travels for business and how he'll look up on the internet in whatever city he has to be at for work, a church. And he's looking for a, a like-minded church, a sister church, uh, something that might feel like Grace Bible Church. And he has said in almost every city he goes, he has been able to find people that when he walks in the door, he's loved and welcomed. What an encouragement that is. You have to be on the road. You've got to be away from your family. Maybe you're traveling on vacation and you step into a group of believers that just express selfless love through the pursuit of kindness to strangers and make them feel like strangers no more. Whether it's traveling missionaries coming through, whether it's taking a visitor out to lunch after the service or inviting them into your home, whether it's helping people move here or helping people move in or meeting housing needs. These two commands in Romans 12, 13, owning the needs of other Christians and pursuing a heart of hospitality, they have some significant things in common. They are two expressions of genuine love and they are costly. They will require resources. They will require time and money of which you are a steward. They require the expending of resources. And if you are truly meeting the needs of other believers, if you are truly pursuing hospitality, then you are expending resources you never intend to get back. Calvin said, to do good to those from whom we expect the least recompense is the heart of this kind of love. Just to give and give and give. This is a reflection of our Savior's love, is it not? The one who left heaven, the one who had every claim to everything in the universe, left the comforts left the ease and the recognition of his honor to come to earth, to come to where we are. We, his enemies, we who were in need, we who were outsiders, he came to meet our needs and to practice hospitality to make us strangers no more. By coming to earth, participating with us in flesh, taking on human flesh and going to a cross and taking our sins upon himself, bearing them before the Father, removing them from believers as far as the east is from the west and bringing us home. To meet the needs of others, to practice hospitality, is to live out what Jesus Christ himself has done and modeled for us. It is to be under the reign of grace and to see that grace transforming our lives and making its way out in selfless love to the lives of others. And it is an investment. Uh, you can read sometime the top 20 bad investments where people poured all of their resources into stocks, into startups that went south. That money, gone. Time, resources, expenditures in meeting needs and hospitality is money and time and resources you will not get back in this life. But it is the greatest investment you can make. It redounds into eternity. It reflects your Savior's love. And it models to a watching world what Jesus' love for his body and what the body's care for itself ought to look like. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these directives. Thank you for giving us instruction on what the Christian life should look like. Thank you for the power by your grace to live these things out. And, and we don't do it perfectly now, we fall short in so many ways in these needs. These are lofty attainments, lofty goals, and yet we want to aim at them and be dependent upon your spirit and your grace and your power to pursue these things for your glory and for the good of your people, for the progress of the gospel. 
We pray for help in all of it in Jesus' name. Amen.